Hello. Today we're going to be talking about a way of visualising data called a box plot. These are also known as box and whisker plots. You see box plots an awful lot if you look into scientific literature and it's important to understand how they work. So why do we use box plots? Well they're a simple way of visualising a variable or variables. They convey a great deal of information. You can put a lot of stuff in a box plot and it can tell you a great deal about what's going on in your data set. And then they're very useful for making comparisons between groups, if you have groups of data within a variable, or for making comparisons between variables. So let's, let's start off by just quickly revisiting some of the basic fundamentals of the way we describe frequency distributions and data sets. So let's quickly look at a frequency distribution. This distribution here is uh, the annual population growth per country for almost all of the countries in the world from 2014. These are data published by the World Bank. And you can look at that frequency distribution and you can see that it's, it's certainly at least approximately normally distributed. It's roughly bell shaped. It's symmetrical about the center. So how can we describe that frequency distribution? Well, first of all, it has a central tendency. There is a, a center of the frequency distribution and we can give a location for that central tendency. And that location can be given either as a mean, as a median or a mode, one of the three M's that we use to describe the middle of, an, of a symmetrical data set. So there's a central tendency and then there's some kind of spread or dispersion around that central tendency. So a symmetrical distribution of data can be wide or it can be narrow and we can describe that, de that degree of spread using something like the standard deviation, sometimes the variance, or alternatively, you might use the interquartile range. And the interquartile range, you might know, is more suitable when you have asymmetrical data sets than when you have symmetrical data sets. So that's our data set, the frequency distribution of annual population growth per country. Now let's have a look at what that data set looks like when we draw it as a box plot. So here's the box plot. First thing you can see is that it's been flipped on its side by comparison with the histogram we looked at in the first place. Not all box plots are drawn vertically. In fact, we're going to see quite a lot that aren't in just a minute, but this one is drawn vertically. And you can see there's a kind of box in the middle. There are bits sticking out. There are little circles at the top and bottom. It's a bit confusing if you've not met one of these before. So let's go through the components of our box plot one by one, and I'll explain what they are. So first of all, there is this big, thick black line in the middle, in the middle of the box plot, and that's sometimes called the hinge. And what the hinge indicates is the median of the data set. So it's telling us where the location of the center of the data set is. And in this case, you can see that it's around about one. OK, so the middle value, if you took all of those numbers, ranked them from the smallest to the biggest and took the middle one, would be about one. So the hinge shows us the median. Next, we've got this box drawn around the median. This is called the box, hence box plot. And what this indicates is the interquartile range or IQR. So if you took those ranked data and you divided them into four equally sized groups, the median would define the middle, and then the lower quartile defines the bottom of the interquartile range, and the upper quartile defines the top of the interquartile range. So overall, the interquartile range contains the middle 50% of the data. So 50% of all the numbers within our, within our data set lie between about a half and just over two. So that's the interquartile range. That's denoted by the box. Then we've got these bits sticking out from the box and these are called the whiskers. So box and whisker plot has the box and the whiskers. Now what these whiskers are actually showing is a little bit obscure. So what this whisker does is it's drawn from the bottom quartile or the top quartile depending on whether it's the lower or the upper whisker and it extends to the last data point that's less than one and a half times the interquartile range from that quartile. That may sound like madness to you, and that would be a reasonable response to that. You know, what is, what is this line? What's it showing us? But what you need to know is that if you have normally distributed data, 
then on average, slightly over 99% of all the data points will lie within that range. So if you draw the whiskers going above and below the box, if your data are normally distributed, then slight, I think it's 99.3%, but you can think of it as 99% of all the data points should lie within that range that's denoted by the whiskers. And then finally, we've got these data points that are drawn in above and below the whiskers. So any data points that are above or below that value are, are actually drawn in as the individual data points. And you'll often hear these called outliers. I don't like using that word because it implies that these are outliers in the sense of data points that shouldn't be in the data set. That's not necessarily the case at all. Obviously, 99% of the values should lie within the range shown by the whiskers. So if you have a thousand data points, on average, you'd expect to get 10 of these outliers, even if your data are all following a perfect normal distribution. So calling them outliers and implying that there's maybe something funny about them is, is, is a little bit questionable in my opinion. I would rather they were called something like extreme values. However, outliers seems to be set in the literature. So we'll carry on calling them that with the caveat that we have to be careful about using that word. So that's a box plot. And what we can do now is we can flip that box plot on its side and we can draw it above that frequency distribution that we saw before. So in this graph, we have the same frequency distribution of population growth rates in percentage that we looked at before. And then we have the box plot drawn on its side above it. And what you can see is that the hinge with the median corresponds to the middle of the distribution. So that's showing us the central tendency. You can see that the box corresponds to the main chunk of the data in the middle of that normal distribution. You can see that the whiskers encompass almost all of the values in the data set. And then you can see that the outliers correspond to the, the data points that are showing up as individual data points at the extreme ends of our normal distribution. So that's a basic introduction to a box plot. So why do we use box plots? Well, one thing you can do with a box plot is you can get an indication of what the shape of the frequency distribution is. So far, we've been looking at, an, at a roughly symmetrical frequency distribution, and you've seen that the box plot looks roughly symmetrical. What happens when we use a, a, when we use a frequency distribution that's not symmetrical? So here, we have some data from a paper by Healy et al. And this is on lifespans in animals. And this particular data set here is the maximum lifespans from 125 species of artiodactyls. So artiodactyls are the even hoofed ungulates. So things like giraffes, wildebeest, goats, all of these are artiodactyls. And each of the data points here is one species. And we have the maximum recorded lifespan for that species. And what you can see if you look at the frequency distribution drawn at the bottom is that these data are positively skewed. There is a long tail heading away from the zero value on the x-axis and heading up into the larger values. So there is some positive skew in these data. And you can see that that positive skew is reflected in our box plot, which once again, I've drawn horizontally above it. So the box plot is asymmetrical in much the same way as the frequency distribution is. In this case, the actual box and the whiskers themselves are roughly symmetrical around the median, but you can see that all of those outlying data points are high values. There are no low values there at all. So that's reflecting the fact that we have a data set here with some moderate positive skew. Now, what about a data set with some extreme positive skew? Here, we've got some data from the same publication, but this is for the rodents, and these are data from 194 species of rodent. And you can see that this data set has more skew than the artiodactyls did. So there is this long tail extending a long, long way up, and that, that positive skew is once again reflected in the box plot. But in this case, the whole box plot is asymmetrical. So first of all, you can see that once again, all of those outlying data points are high values. There are no low values indicated as outliers. But also you can see that the whiskers 
are asymmetrical. The lower whisker is much shorter than the upper whisker. And then also the location of the median in the interquartile range is not in the middle. So the lower quartile or the, the second quartile, which is the bit from the median to the bottom of the box, is much narrower than the third quartile, which is the bit from the median to the upper end of the box. And again, that's reflecting the fact that these data are squished up towards the lower values, and then you have that long tail extending off towards the higher values. So the whole box plot is asymmetrical in this case. So you can, you can look at a box plot and it can tell you things about the shape and the location of the data set you're looking at. And you might say to me, well, why are we bothering to do this when you can get that information and more from just looking at a frequency histogram? And the answer is that box plots really come into their own when you're plotting multiple variables or when you have a variable that's grouped and you wanna make comparisons between the groups. So let's have a look at the kind of box plot that you might get if you have, if you have grouped data and you want to compare between the groups. So these are more data from that Healy paper on maximum lifespan. This is for mammals. And here, the, mam the lifespan of these mammals has been divided into those that are fossorial, where fossorial is a science word, which means it lives in burrows and it's adapted for digging. So something like a mole rat um, or a mole would be a fossorial animal. Then we have semi-fossorial animals, which spend some of their time in burrows and have some adaptation for digging, but not as much as the fossorial ones. And then we have non-fossorial animals, which don't live in burrows. And we can compare between these groups in our maximum lifespan variable by using a box plot. First thing you can see looking at these data is, unsurprisingly, given what we've seen already, there's some positive skew. So all of these box plots are more or less asymmetrical. You could argue that the non-fossorial animals show a bit more skew than, than the others. Um, that's maybe a bit of a judgment call, but certainly they're showing the non-fossorial animals are showing a bit more skew than the fossorial ones. So you can compare the amount of skew between your groups, but you can also compare the location of your groups and ask questions like, well, which groups on average have the longer lifespans, which groups on average have the shorter lifespans. And you can see just by looking at this box plot that it's the non-fossorial animals that tend to have the longer lifespans, or the, the longer maximum lifespans. They don't all have lifespans which are longer than the fossorial or the semi-fossorial animals, but a good number of them do have. And one thing you can notice, if you look at the location of the median of the non-fossorial animals, that median is above the interquartile range for both the fossorial and the semi-fossorial animals. So you can use this box plot to see patterns in the data. You can use it as a quick, early indication of where there might be some patterns in the data when you're analyzing a complex data set like this. So this is where box plots tend to get used more than anywhere else. Um, it's quite a pain drawing out a series of frequency histograms and comparing them. And often it's not as clear what's going on as if you're comparing box plots like this. Finally, a word of warning. Box plots are great. They're really good in your early investigative analysis of your data when you're trying to work out what's going on. But you have to be a little bit careful. I'm just going to finish off with an example of a box plot which doesn't show an important pattern in the data set. These data here are from a paper by, by myself and Keita Matsumoto. Um, these data are mandible lengths. In fact, they're log mandible lengths. I should have said that on the x-axis label there, sorry. These data are log mandible lengths from a stag beetle called Odontolabis cuvera. These are all measurements from males. And what you can see looking at the frequency histogram is that there seem to be two peaks in that frequency distribution. So in other words, this is a bimodal distribution of data. There's one peak with a, a maximum value slightly under two, and one peak with a maximum value slightly under three. So these data are bimodal. And if you look at the box plot, there's no sign of that bimodality at all in the box plot. The box itself is kind of stretched out, um, but there's, there's nothing else. And if you think about it, there's actually no way that a box plot can show bimodality 
um, because there isn't that there, there simply isn't a way for it to do it. If you're interested, the reason why these data are bimodal is that the males of this species come in a variety of different flavors, and that peak, that upper peak, corresponds to stag beetle males with very large mandibles, and then the bottom peak corresponds to actually two different kinds of stag beetle males. We have ones with sort of medium sized mandibles that are morphologically different from the ones with the large mandibles and we also have ones with very small mandibles. Why we see this difference we don't know. It was first described by um, Mark Rowland and Doug Emlin a few years ago um, but there seem to be an increasing number of animals reported with these kind of multi more uh, with, with multiple morphs in the males which probably reflect different mating behavior that they engage in but anyway this last example is just to show you that you have to be a little bit careful with using box plots and if there's any indication that there might be sort of bimodality or something like that in the data you're probably best off looking at a frequency histogram as well okay thank you <laughs>